for the introduction. So yeah, this talk's gonna be about Aftermath, um, which used to be um, a specific tool for performance analysis of para programs, and which is now becoming a toolkit for building specialized um, tools for performance analysis. So if we talk about uh, performance analysis, um, we must talk about what happens at execution time, and there are usually a few components involved into this. So you have your application, um, there's usually a runtime system that manages the execution, uh, there's the operating system and the hardware, of course, that um, actually executes the instructions. Each of these components is already very complex in itself, but on top of that, you have very complex interactions between them. So if you want to understand the performance of your program, you must understand what's going on at execution time, what are these interactions, and uh, what's going on in the different uh, parts. And last but not least, you want to relate this back to the programming model. So if you're an OpenMP programmer, for example, you want to reason in terms of um, parallel loops and tasks and not in terms of um, outline functions by the compilers or um, some memory addresses. So this is a cross-layer process. Um, at the very top, you have the programming model and your application and the various levels of abstraction um, that you can go down. So one way of um, uh, recording what's uh, actually happening at execution time is to record all the dynamic events um, or the subset that you're interested in to a trace file. So it would instrument um, the parts which are interesting. Um, so for example, the, the runtime system, you could query the operating system for what's going on. You can use hardware performance counters and so on. And you dump this into a trace file at execution time, and then in a post-mortem um, analysis phase, you load the trace into a, a tool for performance analysis, such as Aftermath. So this allows you then to visualize what's in the trace, to explore it interactively, to get statistics about the trace data, and um, also to do this programming model-centric analysis and cross-layer analysis. So we built a tool for this for um, OpenMP and OpenStream, um, which was called, or which is still called Aftermath. And it looked a little bit like this. So um, you have the central timeline component that shows you the activity over the time. On the right uh, side, you have statistical counters and information about um, uh, what's going on in the hardware, for example, um, ex data exchanges between NUMA nodes. You have filters and uh, various things that you can uh, use interactively. We had various views, so these heat maps, for example, that show you where slow tasks are located. Um, you could plot hardware performance counters on top of that, and so on. There were many, many views, and many things you could do with the tool. And we actually used this for real-world things, so um, we used it for the optimization of um, uh, runtime systems, namely OpenStream. Um, we used it for performance debugging of parallel applications, both in OpenStream and OpenMP. Um, and we also started using it on heterogeneous platforms that employ a program model that uses both CPUs and GPUs. However, um, we couldn't cover all the different use cases. So if you try to cover all of this, um, you end up with a tool which is very complex. So if we, I go back to this um, uh, figure here, actually there are a lot of things that um, can go on in the different um, parts, in the different components. And in addition to that, uh, there are more and more programming models. And finally, you can aggregate data and visualize it in various ways. So if you want to um, build a tool that covers all of this, you will end up with a tool which is very complex. So depending on actually what you try to do, who you are, and what you're using, your needs for performance analysis might um, vary. So um, that might depend on the programming model, um, on who you are, so if you're a domain expert, if you're a hardware expert, if you're a student, and also what you are looking for. And all of this might evolve over time. So instead of having one big tool that integrates everything and anything, we think it's better to have specialized tools for each purpose. So, um, for example, if, you're just, um, if you just want to browse the, the trace, you, uh, you might uh, want to have a timeline explorer, uh, that just shows the timeline but nothing else. Um, you might want a tool which is quite specific to your programming model, um, something to compare traces, uh, something that's more close to the, the architecture that you're using, 
Or sometimes you don't want a graphical user interface at all. You just want to um, generate graphs and include them in, in your publications or whatever. So this is uh, where the next generation of Aftermath comes into the place. So we're now trying to provide a toolkit that helps you building specialized tools. So the goals that we're trying to achieve here is that, first of all, we think it should be easy to build, compose, and extend these specialized tools. And that should be, um, uh, the user should be able to do this interactively as well. Also, it should be easy to share these tools. So you don't want to tell your colleague somewhere, okay, you have to grab the source code, then compile it, do this and that, then load the trace. Well, you want something um, that you can share easily and maybe just a configuration file that you can pass to somebody else and he will have the same tool and the same views as you have. Also, we don't want to um, let the user faith, uh, face just a blank page. Um, so instead of saying, okay, here's the toolkit, now you can build whatever you want, we also want to provide some, um, some instances of actual tools that uh, the user can build on and then modify. And finally, it should be easy to port um, this kit to new programming models. So if you're a researcher in um, parallel programming and you have your own parallel programming language, it should be easy to adopt the toolkit to support your language as well. Okay, so this is how we try to respond to these goals. Um, so first of all, we propose a type system, which is basically just um, a Python file with um, definitions that define uh, the data types which are used in the on-disk format, so the trace format, and the in-memory representation of a trace uh, after it has been loaded into memory. Um, then we have this composable analysis system, um, which is basically, which boils down to using um, nodes and interconnecting them. I will talk about this um, in a few minutes. And we have a system that uh, allows you to build modular graphical user interfaces. Um, and to, to reference different widgets in a definition file that then can uh, be loaded by Aftermath. Okay, yeah, so the, the modular GUI part is not very exciting, so basically we provide a set of widgets uh, which you can then reference in a definition file and each of these files defines actually what your tool looks like. Ideally, you should be able to add widgets on the fly and remove them as you um, progress with your performance analysis. You might start with something, um, you know, you, you browse your timeline and then you see, okay, ah, maybe I want to have a closer look at this and that. So you would add widgets and um, transform your tool on the fly. We haven't implemented this uh, exactly now, um, but we're working on it and we're very close to it. Okay, so the idea is that you can go from one tool to another dynamically. Now for the custom analysis, um, I will have to talk a bit, little bit about the nodes and this graphical system um, that we propose. So actually what you start out with is um, node types. A node type is just a set um, of statically typed input and output ports, which you see on the left and right hand side in the figure a set of properties that can be set by the user, which configure um, how the node reacts. Um, there's a processing function that must be specified that actually defines what the node does when it is evaluated. And finally, we have um, uh, a set of uh, property get and set functions to react to uh, changes by the user and a set of port dependencies for scheduling. Um, I will talk about this um, a little bit later on. So building your custom analysis basically boils down to instantiating these node types and connecting them. So um, what then happens at execution is that um, a node produces output data on its output ports, which is um, uh, a typed array, so it's a certain number of elements, which is then passed to the consumer node. And there are different types of nodes, so we try to integrate everything into this nodal system. So there might be data nodes which um, extract data from the trace, there are algorithmic nodes which um, produce intermediate results, and there are also GUI nodes which actually um, can display data uh, on screen. So to give you an idea of um, what this looks like, um, let's suppose we want to build a tool where we have this uh, a timeline component and then two labels that show the minimum and maximum duration of the tasks which are um, encountered in the trace. So we would have on the left-hand side um, 
a node um, which is able to extract all the task instances from uh, the trace. And on the right-hand side, we have nodes for labels um, uh, which actually display the, the minimum and maximum duration. And in the middle, well, we do something with the tasks which come out of this uh, task instance node. So we would um, extract the different task attributes. So um, for example, the intervals and uh, the type, we won't use the type because we're only interested in the, in the duration. We would feed this into a node which calculates the duration of the tasks, um, then into a node which selects the minimum, uh, converts it to a string, and then finally um, passes it on to the label displaying the minimum. And we would do the same thing for the maximum. And there you are, you have a, a specialized tool um, which shows you this information. Now let's assume that um, you found out that you uh, want to have a closer look at the distribution of task uh, durations. So you would add a histogram, so we would have an extra node um, on the, the presentation side for the histogram, and you would just reuse the, the same data that comes out of this inter interval duration node, build a histogram out of this, and pass it on to the histogram node. And there you are, you have another specialized tool, um, and you have evolved uh, the, the first tool. Now let's assume we want to get interactive and be able to select a portion of the timeline and have the exact same information for the portion of the timeline, so for a selected interval. So we would also have a node um, for the, the timeline, um, and there would um, be a, an output port for the selected interval. We would feed this into um, a filter node, which is able to take a reference interval, and then on a second input um, over here, um, take intervals and only pass on what actually is inside the reference um, interval. So we would put this in, uh, plug this into our graph, and with that we have uh, an interactive version of our tool. Okay, so um, there's a, a link between the graphical user interface now and um, this custom analysis. So this node here actually reacts, the timeline node now reacts to uh, the selection of the user. So the, the graph can be evaluated or will be evaluated every time this interval changes. Now let's assume that we want to get even more interactive and display the duration of um, a task under the mouse cursor. So again, um, we would add a few nodes. Um, we would, would take the mouse position here of the, the timeline node and then um, uh, extract the task which is at that position, uh, extract the task attributes, calculate the duration, and then finally display it in a label um, in the, at the bottom of our tool. So now this um, timeline node um, triggers evaluation on two events, on selection of the interval and on a change of the mouse position. The problem that might arise here is that you can have um, parts of the, uh, this graph which are super heavyweight and which take a lot of time to evaluate and other parts which are more lightweight and you, you want to avoid to recalculate the hope, these, these uh, heavy parts again and again if they always produce the same data. So you need something that avoids this, um, a scheduler for example that is um, able to take this into account uh, so not only take into account the dependencies between the nodes, but also the, the age of the data, and then react to it accordingly. And this is where these port dependencies come into, uh, into the game. So I won't list all the different kinds of port dependencies that you can have, um, but I will give you two examples. So port dependencies basically define what happens when something happens on an input or output port. So for example, if a node receives uh, new data on one of the input ports, it could define that it will generate new data on all the output ports and definitely pull in data on all the other input ports in order to um, calculate these new values. Or another example, if somebody asks, if a consumer asks, do I provide new data on an output port, um, I could respond to this by asking my producers if they produce new data. Okay, so here's the outline of the scheduling algorithm that uses these port dependencies. So first, um, we have the node that triggers the evaluation of the graph. So it indicates where new data is, uh, will be produced. Then we have a pre-scheduling phase which actually recursively applies the port dependencies to all the neighbors until this converges for the whole graph. And then, um, in the end, we only execute 
those nodes which uh, produce new data, which receive new data, or which definitely need data regardless of the age. So for example, um, let's say we have a change of the mouse position, so this would be new data um, which becomes available, and on the interval we have old data because the uh, interval hasn't changed, then this would um, propagate through the graph so um, the, the nodes at the, the bottom will all produce uh, new data. But at the top, we have a different situation. Um, we say we offer only old data, so the, the node here would say, okay, um, for now I only offer old data, but I have to ask my, um, my producers if they produce new data and so on. And when this converges, we finish with uh, something like this. And when we come to the execution, we will actually find out that this node um, here doesn't get new data on its input side, so it will only produce old data on the output side, so it doesn't have to be evaluated. And this propagates through the graph, um, through the whole um, top part of the graph. And for the bottom, bottom part, well, we have to execute the nodes. So we avoided to reevaluate this heavy part um, every time we, sing, we, um, we change the mouse position. Okay, let me say a few words about why um, we think it is a good idea to release this under an open source, a free software license. So Aftermath is already available um, under free software license, both this first version that I've uh, shown at the very beginning of the presentation and also this new version that we are going to release uh, will be released under um, a free software license. So first of all, we have a very tight coupling between instrumentation, processing, and analysis. Even if you just instrument um, your runtime using Aftermath, you will still use code which comes from Aftermath. Um, so it makes sense to uh, make this code available. Um, also, we have a very user-centric uh, contribution model. So our users know best what they actually want. And it wouldn't make sense to have this closed source and then um, have our users ask us to integrate what they think is good. It's faster and easier if they can contribute directly. Um, also in teaching, it's always good to have um, open tools uh, to understand everything. And finally, um, this also facilitates collaboration scientific projects. If you always have to get back to a project partner for a small change, this only costs a lot of time. It doesn't, um, doesn't help you. So the old version of Aftermath is available at aftermathtracing.com and the new version will be released very soon on that very same website within the next um, couple of weeks. Okay, so in summary, um, Aftermath used to be a specific tool for OpenMP and OpenStream, but is now becoming a toolbox for building performance analysis tools. It's extensible by default, so both um, the trace format and the data model, as well as the analysis, um, can be fully customized by the users and in a very easy way. And we are about to release specific tool instances which can be used as a base to build your own performance analysis tools. So we will release uh, things for OpenMP, OpenStream, and others to come. It's freely available online at this address. Um, we're almost there. There's a little bit of work um, that still needs to be done. Um, but this is uh, going to be finished in the, in the next uh, days and weeks. Um, you will be able to import your old traces if you are an old Aftermath user. And we are very interested in, um, in hearing about what you uh, would like to see in a performance analysis tool and what you would use such a toolkit for. So with this, uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions.